Hi again, Sean Tippett from Silver Spring Networks. I'm the Director of Business Development for IoT as well as Smart Cities. Um, so as witnessed by this show, we've seen a dramatic increase in the interest around Smart Cities. Um, and when cities come to us, they're very focused on what have previous cities done to become successful? What were the lessons learned? And that's really what I wanted to describe today. And we could call it lessons or also characteristics of these cities that they probably started out this way before deploying uh, these systems. That's what made them fairly progressive. So a little bit about Silver Spring Networks. Um, we are a data and network platform provider. We essentially build very large, scalable, secure outdoor networks for our customers. We're currently in our fifth generation of meshing technology. Uh, it provides 2.4 megabits per second, and if you're techie, 10 milliseconds of latency from hop to hop. We've had 25 million devices deployed worldwide. Our largest deployment is essentially Northern California with five and a half million devices, every single device successfully talking back to the head end system six times a day, 99.9% .9 of the time. We're inherently a multi-application system, meaning that you deploy us with one type of sensor in the beginning, but then add other applications on top, and that comes a lot from our standards-based focus. And then finally, our customers have really driven us to be future-proof as well as backwards compatible, because these systems need to stay viable for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And in order to be able to accept new technology, you have to have things be backwards compatible so that you don't strand existing assets. So Silver Spring Networks, we really work with two customer sets. Uh, we work with the, the utility world. We also work with smart cities. Um, in the utility space, we're actually the leader in smart grid. Um, in the city space, we're the leader in wireless streetlight controls. Um, in the utilities, uh, the killer app is the electric smart meter. For cities, what we really see the killer app is the uh, intelligent streetlight control system. So the renovation that's going throughout the world is taking LED lights, and, uh, sorry, taking inefficient high pressure sodium lights and converting them to LED. At the same time, if you add controls on, the, on top, it's still a positive business case. And so by that very fact, you have, through a positive business case, deployed a smart city network. And then you can enable all these other applications underneath, uh, smart water, smart gas, traffic, environmental sensors. All of that comes from the fact that you've already deployed a, a smart streetlight control network. So what are the four lessons or four characteristics of these smart city customers that we've already worked with? Well, the first characteristic is embrace open, open ecosystems, and that's really in two, kind of in two, uh, two areas. Uh, cities want to choose vendors that are standards-based, because standards are vetted, and they'll also have support with, uh, with ecosystem partners. So things like IPv6, the talc standard, standard radio interfaces, those become very important. The second important uh, aspect of openness is m lots of vendors in an ecosystem. So a city has a choice of which environmental sensor to go with or which smart streetlight controller sensor to go with. So a great example for us uh, on this vein is the city of Glasgow, where we tried out multiple LED lights, multiple versions of the smart streetlight controller, uh, intelligent cameras for traffic analysis, other sensors such as noise sensors or uh, environmental sensors. All the data was collected in through a head-end system, some of the examples, and published on open APIs. So another characteristic or lesson of a successful smart city is the fact that they are collaborative. Uh, and that collaboration falls both financially as well as organizationally. You go back. So from a financial standpoint, if you have a lighting operator in a city who installs a smart streetlight controller, 
the ability for that asset to be used by everyone in the city or even third parties becomes pretty critical. But also organizationally, we see that with our smart cities, that they tend to develop these smart city councils where they have representation from every division within the city to be able to trade learning as well as use cases so that every group within the city has the ability to uh, uh, leverage this multi-user uh, this multi -user asset or, or multi-application asset. A good he example here is our work with the city of Paris. They have 180,000 lights that are connected together. Um, that lends to traffic control systems and then to other tangential applications, things like advertising panels, which can be used for citizen awareness as well as for additional revenue generation. Bristol is using their IoT network as a competitive tool. So they're offering it up as a sandbox to the startup community to essentially reinvigorate or invigorate uh, IoT development within the city of Bristol itself. The third lesson is that smart city is not a project, it's a process. And so cities have developed ways to make sure that new applications are onboarded as they come up because I think that the, the best new smart city application is one that hasn't been invented yet. Um, so on the vendor side, that puts a little bit of requirements on the vendor in that the vendor needs to be able to evolve with the customer as well. So being able to download new firmware as new features arise, and the ability to incorporate new generations of technology as, as the new generations arise becomes pretty crucial. Finally, uh, uh, smart cities are successful when they always keep the citizen in mind. Because these, these systems are deployed uh, through the taxes of the citizen, and if the citizen doesn't understand what their money is being used for, it could lead to a, an unsuccessful project. And in my example here is actually around a utility, Florida Power and Light. Um, Florida Power and Light, real, uh, if a light breaks and they know about it, a street light breaks and they know about it, it takes them three days to fix it. But typically, it takes a citizen three weeks to report that a light is out before then it takes the three days to fix it. So from Florida Power and Light's standpoint, the citizen views this thing as taking a month to get fixed, which they viewed was totally un unacceptable. And so that was really the main business case for them to, to deploy smart streetlight control. Um, the other interesting application, uh, probably Florida's most vulnerable citizenship, is uh, baby turtles. So we used intelligent streetlight controls during hatching season to make sure that the, the turtles followed the moon instead of gravitating towards a street light. So that was the four lessons. Thank you. That worked? The turtles really yes. did that? Yeah. They, uh, right. they, uh, traditionally, they had to send out crews to go and turn these lights off manually, but now they can just signal it down to the street lights. That's great. So you, you talked a lot about intelligent lighting, but there's, all, you know, there's a lot um, of smart city applications that can leverage that pole, that is the, that street light, and those may revolve around other budget centers within a city. So can you just give us a little bit of insight into how that all might work? Yeah, so I think um, smart water. So certainly from California, water is a very important asset, being able to, to hook up a pervasive water metering system. Um, if the city happens to have gas assets or uh, traffic controls we see to also be important, being able to provide network connectivity to the intersection. Um, and then, you know, certainly a little bit on environmental sensors and noise sensors, things such as that. So when all that can come into play, then do different pools of, of budget money within a city government help to pay? Or is it always just, you know, Transportation. Yeah, from a from a money. from a business model standpoint, we can set it up such that um, every incremental endpoint just is a per dollar per year fee that could come out of that other that other division's budget. Um, can you talk about a little bit about what this all means for city IT departments? Well, so that's a it's an interesting point. Uh, when we deploy to utilities, we often find. Um, 
a group or an entity that has very deep IT resources. They know about redundant data centers. They know how to do IPv6. And, okay. and cities typically don't want to have to expand their IT services. And so our model into the cities is to actually provide the network as a service. So they, they buy the initial endpoint hardware, and then everything north of that, we do all the, the heavy lifting. They get access into the application, but we just make sure it works. And we actually guarantee the network as well. So I think you know, looking at other providers, getting a, an actual network guarantee is something that's uh, probably pretty difficult to get. Now, who are the other providers? I know you said you're the leader, but who do you, who do cities have to pick when they're trying to figure well, this out? So, our general belief is, is that in a, that a smart city is going to always have multiple different network providers in there. Okay. Because they'll always mention that they want some amount of Wi-Fi, some amount of fiber. They want all their devices connected, um, and and I think what what our technology provides is it provides pervasive citywide connectivity at a very low infrastructure cost. So if you if you take a look at something like, for example, a city the size of Chicago, 250,000 lights, it only takes about 40 gateways for us. Or if you look at something like Wi-Fi, it's really about one and a half million dollars per square mile. So, so our advice is deploy high bandwidth tactically where you need it but then for things that need ubiquitous coverage, use systems such as ours. About how much does each gateway cost? Oh, the, gate, the gateway is probably less than, you know, a, a dollar an endpoint amortized over all the endpoints. One gateway for us um, can talk to five to 10,000 devices. Okay, okay. And we've talked about this a little bit, but um, are there any other smart city applications that you see coming up in the near future that we haven't discussed? Um, you know, I think that uh, as we continue to go to other municipalities as well as cities, I think cities are starting to get a lot more active in the um, in their electric distribution grid. So I think yeah. a lot of the things that we work on the utility Utilities, side is yeah. starting to blend over into the city side. But um, but I think it's it's being able to provide these hardware development kits to innovators. You know, when we go into a new city, there's usually a little uh, some some alley or some area where where these companies want to innovate so providing them the technology to be able to innovate in their city and that's where you're going to see the new applications and the value created right correct yep okay okay great do we have any questions for sean yeah i've got okay. one martha are we on here maybe i don't have one <laughs> so, okay sean i'm joe madden mobile experts uh, i'm interested in the uh the example you talk about 500,000 streetlights driving 2 million devices total. So that's basically branching out from the streetlight case to a wider business case with other devices. What's the extension of that? What's what's the end game? Do you see that going from 500,000 streetlights to 10 million devices or 20 million in that same area? Uh, as you go to garbage and water and, and every yeah. other city service, uh, what do you think is the end game there? Well, I mean, it's, um, so your question, I don't know if, if people heard it, the question is, is how many different application sets can you, can you provide and what's, what's the end game? Our, traditionally what we found is, is that we continue to have a stacked business value. So every new application you add to the, to the system continues to, to, to leverage or pass the, the initial cost. Our architecture is such that you can just essentially plunk down new access points in an area and devices automatically converge around it. So there's really never any fear of, of overtaxing the system. That was one of the prime reasons why we went to IPv6 because of its just huge address space. There's actually, it, you, there, there's no conceivable way to, to really run out of, of headroom or bandwidth. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so certainly on the streetlights, you have a constantly powered device, something that always has power by tw a seven by 24. Uh, we have another system called the Milinec, which is essentially a, a radio component, something that could be mounted inside of, a, of another sensor that runs off of battery. So it, it talks to the same network, but this is something that doesn't require you to, to install it with power, 
battery lasts 10, 15 years. So, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Any other questions for Sean? Yeah, so the question is, are we exclusively a mesh network? So, I mean, the, the, the way to think about mesh networking is the device will go to the gateway on one hop if it can. So, so if it can make it on its own, and, you know, we have examples of gateways deployed on, um, uh, in high-rises in San Francisco shooting across the bay for 17 miles and, and connecting to a device. That's not the typical experience, but that, that feels very star-like, but, but if it does need to leverage another device, it will. So it'll try to go direct if it can, but if it doesn't, you know, it, it, it leverages other devices. We have a good picture of, um, of a deployment in Hawaii with Diamond Head, and it shows, it shows the network bending around the mountain to be able to, to reach a device. Sorry? So, so the core technology is 900 megahertz spread spectrum. It's based on the Y-Sun Alliance. You've heard of Wi-Fi Alliance, obviously. The, the Y-Sun Alliance is an alliance of vendors that work around the IEEE 802.15.4G, IPv6. Um, so that's the, the radio standard. IPv6 for the transport. For the uh, communication between um, the head-in system and the network, we adhere to the talk standard. All right, anything else for Sean? All right, thank you very right, much, Sean. You.